Across the rolling hills of Virginia, through Maryland's tree-lined streets, and into the bustling heart of the nation's capital, the Potomac Conference Corporation of Seventh-day Adventist stretches across an impressive 43,336 square miles. Established in 1924, this entity merged the strengths of two foundational Seventh-day Adventist conferences, the District of Columbia Conference and the Virginia Conference. The Potomac Conference is a vivid tapestry woven from the colorful heritage and lively energy of these regions, spanning all of Virginia, the nation's capital, and select parts of Maryland, each contributing its distinct thread to the vibrant whole. Perhaps the earliest attempt to spread the Seventh-day Adventist message in the Virginia area occurred back in 1873. That's when Richard Asbury, a Seventh-day Adventist Virginian, returned to Westmoreland County from Wisconsin. He was so convinced that he had found the truth that he offered to pay the expenses of an SDA minister to visit Virginia and share the gospel. But unfortunately, at the time, there were no takers. At about the same time, Newmarket, Virginia resident John Zirkel began receiving literature from his brother Isaac, who had been attending Seventh-day Adventist meetings in Indiana. Intrigued by the information, John and his wife Elizabeth, along with their children, wanted to learn more about these newfound teachings. So they wrote to Isaac and asked if he would send some Adventist ministers to the Shenandoah Valley in an effort to learn more about what they were reading. Soon after, two Adventist pastors arrived in Newmarket, Albert Lane and his wife Ellen, and John Corliss. The preachers, enthusiastic about sharing the Adventist message, began holding meetings on the day after their arrival, January 29th, 1876. One of the evangelists that came happened also to be a Civil War veteran himself. He fought for the Union side and some of his service included here in Virginia. So you just know that he was interested in the kinds of things that took place here in Newmarket. They held a meeting at the Oak Shade Rural Schoolhouse. That's about a mile from the Zirkel Farm. This was the first formal Seventh-day Adventist meeting in Virginia. Soon after, the pastors began holding meetings at the Polytechnic Institute located in downtown Newmarket. The, that school was run by the Lutherans and it was a, a building that they actually kind of had several different schools run by other organizations. One of those schools was a music school. In fact, that's where Anthony Showalter as a young child living in Timberville, just seven miles down the road, took his first music lessons at one of the music schools there. He is the composer of Leaning on the Everlasting Arms, a hymn that we sing to this day. But just after one meeting, the duo was banned from holding additional gatherings by the college trustees. Not easily discouraged, Pastors Lane and Corliss began meeting at the Christian House of Worship in Soliloquy, a town that was not too far from Newmarket. On June 17, 1876, almost seven months after the Adventist preachers arrived in Newmarket, Elizabeth Zirkel was baptized in Smith Creek and became the first Seventh-day Adventist in Virginia. The Zirkel Farm is about a mile and a half west of Newmarket, which is where we are right now. There are a few remnants of the Zirkel Farm left on the campus. One is the location of the farmhouse and also an old fort that had been there, built there during the time of George Washington. Over time, others joined the Advent movement. 
On January 13, 1877, the first Seventh-day Adventist church in Virginia was organized in soliloquy. And while that church building no longer stands, the schoolhouse does, which is where the group later met. In April 1879, the charter members were officially organized as a Seventh-day Adventist church in soliloquy. By March 1883, there were 86 members, three churches in Virginia, and thus the Virginia Conference of Seventh-day Adventists was organized. It took place in the Liberty School in Quicksburg. A.C. Neff was elected as the first president of the Virginia Conference. By the end of 1889, the membership of the Virginia Conference had grown to 520, with five ministers and 14 churches. The headquarters of the Virginia Conference and the Tract Society was located in Richmond from 1894 to 1900, when it moved to Newmarket. Meanwhile, to the north, ministries were taking hold in the nation's capital. From a group started with just five individuals in 1886, the District of Columbia began to develop as a central location for growth. It was deemed a hub where laborers for Christ would gain access to men with far-reaching influence. Beginning as a mission, in a double parlor, they conducted Bible studies and presented lectures to the local population. Evangelistic meetings grew the ministry and increased the membership. In 1893, a small church building was bought on 8th Street Northeast, located between F and G Streets. Despite the city being segregated, this church was unique as it embraced racial integration from its very inception. There was concern that the rapid rise in black converts to the church by a margin of three to one was going to be a deterrent to winning the hearts and the minds for Jesus among the white population. So as a remedy in the spring of 1902, J.S. Washburn and L.C. Sheaf were dispatched to conduct meetings in Washington. However, by the fall, due to challenges in reaching the white population in a segregated city, it was suggested that separate congregations be formed. Consequently, a second church moved much of the white population to a location in northwest Washington at 12th and M Street. In 1902, when fire destroyed the Review and Herald in Battle Creek, Michigan, the Publishing Association decided to move its headquarters to Washington, D.C. It was to be a temporary location, occupying offices that overlooked the U.S. Capitol grounds until its new headquarters could be finished in suburban Tacoma Park, still within the borders of the District of Columbia. By 1909, the influx of institutional personnel led to the establishment of six churches in the District of Columbia and neighboring counties in Maryland and Northern Virginia. The churches laid the foundation for the formation of the District of Columbia Conference. This newly established conference comprised of Washington, D.C., as well as Maryland counties of Montgomery and Prince George's, along with six counties in Virginia. The following year, it expanded to include five additional counties in Virginia and two more in Maryland. During the years that the District of Columbia Conference existed, new churches sprang up in the suburban areas. Just across the border in Tacoma Park, Maryland, the Washington Training College, a liberal arts college, now Washington Adventist University, and the Washington Sanitarium, which then became the Washington Adventist Hospital and now is known as the White Oak Medical Center, were established. Following the loss of numerous counties to the District of Columbia Conference, the Virginia Conference faced challenges in maintaining financial stability, this all due to declining membership, ties, and offerings. However, in April 1924, the Virginia Conference, comprising of 677 members and the District of Columbia Conference, with 1,523 members, merged to establish the Potomac Conference. 
This new conference boasted a total membership of 2,200 individuals served by 33 churches and 14 ministers. Over the next 21 years, membership grew steadily as more individuals were baptized. During this time, racial tensions were high in the United States, and due to segregation and inequality within the church structure, in 1945, 1,000 black members transferred from the Potomac Conference to the newly formed Allegheny Conference. This shift was part of a broader trend in the nation's Adventist church, where regional conferences were created to address the racial tensions and provide African-American members with better representation and leadership opportunities. Today, the Potomac Conference is one of the most diverse conferences in the North American division, representing a wide range of ethnic and cultural groups. For decades, the Potomac Conference headquarters resided in Tacoma Park, Maryland, until it relocated to Stanton, Virginia in 1955. The new location, the Gaymont Estate, was purchased for $46,000, and it featured 12 acres of land, a sizable dwelling, and a three-car garage. The building and the second story of the garage were converted into office spaces, while 10 houses were constructed nearby for the staff. In 1980, the original house was demolished and the conference headquarters began operating from a brand new three-story office building in 1981. Over the span of a century, the conference has witnessed numerous transformations, like its official name change in 2010 from the Potomac Conference to the Potomac Conference Corporation. Yet certain traditions have remained deeply rooted in the hearts and the minds of its members, such as the cherished camp meetings in the Valley. The inaugural camp meeting took place at Valley View Spring near Newmarket, Virginia, during the summer of 1883. At the historic gathering, approximately 150 Adventist believers, including the General Conference President George I. Butler, were present. Within days, that crowd had swelled to do an impressive 1,500 attendees. Four years later, camp meeting attracted crowds of 2,000, necessitating special excursion trains to accommodate the influx of participants. Recollections of the early years evoke fond memories of vibrant song services, compelling sermons, warm fellowship, bustling tents, and mouth-watering veggie burgers from the snack shop. Reminiscing, attendees remember when twice the weather brought down the main tents requiring the services of the local fire department. Despite the camaraderie, the enduring friendships, and annual spiritual renewal amidst the pristine country air, attendance gradually waned over time. The declining turnout and rising expenses prompted a hiatus in the Valley Camp Meeting gatherings, much to the disappointment of Potomac Conference members. However, years later, in a heartening turn of events in 2023, the cherished tradition of camp meeting was revitalized on the grounds of the Shenandoah Valley Academy. As hundreds poured into the valley, they joyfully reconnected in ways reminiscent of days gone by. In 1924, the Potomac Conference began with 2,200 members and 14 pastors. 100 years later, there are 40,000 members, nearly 200 congregations, and over 120 pastors. Meaning that, in the 100 years since the Potomac Conference was formally organized, the conference has seen a 1,686.4% growth rate. To God be the glory. That growth can be attributed to the dedicated work of pastors, evangelists, teachers, 
and, of course, our faithful laity. The Pastoral Ministries Department provides resources to help its pastors and churches grow by emphasizing mission, vision, and values. In the Potomac Conference, we believe that Ephesians 4, 12 through 13 provides the foundation for the work of the pastor to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. The Hispanic Ministries Department is intricately involved in building up the body of Christ. 38% of Potomac's membership is housed within the Hispanic Ministries Department. They are the fastest growing population in the conference. The department's vision is to plant healthy churches and make men and women disciples for all generations with leaders who are committed to preaching the gospel. Through evangelism, small group ministries, and baptisms, the work within the Hispanic community continues to grow at exponential rates. Presently, there are 62 churches, seven companies, and 13 mission groups. Mission-focused, the annual Hispanic camp meeting draws more than 4,000 attendees every year where developing dynamic disciples for Jesus remains the cornerstone of their gathering. In 1907, during the Sabbath School and Young People's Convention held in Mount Vernon, Ohio, the General Conference selected the name for this valued group of enthusiastic youth. They settled on Seventh-day Adventist Young People's Society of Missionary Volunteers. For decades, it was affectionately referred to as the MV Society. In the Potomac Conference, the youth ministry has grown significantly over the past 100 years, notably through the Pathfinder Ministry and the newly introduced Children's Ministry Department. Despite numerous changes and expansions, the primary goal of Adventist Youth Ministry is to prepare young people for service in God's work. It has remained consistent throughout the years. The Youth Department organizes regular events throughout the year to nurture and galvanize young church leaders, inspiring and equipping them to become dynamic disciples. The Potomac Conference oversees two secondary educational institutions, its boarding school, the Shenandoah Valley Academy, located in Newmarket, Virginia, and founded in 1908. Potomac also owns and operates a day school, Tacoma Academy in Tacoma Park, Maryland. The school first opened its doors in 1904 as part of the Washington Training College, now known as Washington Adventist University. Currently, the Potomac Conference Corporation operates 16 schools, educating over 1,700 students from pre-K through the 12th grade. The goal of the Education Department is to deliver high-quality instruction through dedicated Christian educators while actively preparing its students to be members of the Kingdom of God. The end goal was that I wanted them to connect to God. Yes, I want to be them to be successful in the world and I want them to have a great education and all of that is important, but the, my end game is I want them to know Jesus. And so, as a parent, I always looked at every single opportunity of how I could connect them to God. In 1956, a 200-acre youth camp was purchased near Montebello, Virginia, nestled in a secluded spot within the Blue Ridge Mountains at a cost of $11,500. An additional 74 acres of adjoining land were acquired in 1976. When camp first started way back in the 50s, all of our conferences were buying up acreage and starting summer camps. And summer camps were just a time where we used the camps just during summer and the rest of the time a caretaker came and, and was there 
for just the rest of the year. But the philosophy of camp and the usage of camp over time has changed significantly. And so there's been a lot of modifications done to Camp Blue Ridge to provide a year-round atmosphere for people to be able to come, use the camp, do church retreats, spiritual retreats, outdoor educations, and just connecting at times. Kind of our mission is to provide a place that people can come, connect with God and nature in, in, a, in a safe place. Over the years, the camp has grown significantly. The current facilities are comprised of 22 cabins, a four-unit motel, and a new state-of-the-art cafeteria that also functions as a meeting facility. Town Hall, a central gathering spot for guests at the camp, has recently been renovated and can now host up to 150 guests. The scenic surroundings at Camp Blue Ridge are complemented by the presence of the Thai River. A five-acre lake winding through the grounds is suitable for canoeing. Several hiking trails offer nature's treadmill for exercise enthusiasts. All of the buildings are equipped for winter use and the main roads and parking area are paved, facilitating year-round use by over 5,000 guests at Camp Blue Ridge every year. It just was apparent how much the camp ministry is needed for our constituents and our communities because the devil really is working hard to tear us apart. He doesn't want us to have a relationship with each other, much, much less with our Holy Heavenly Father. And so bringing people to camp just provides a place where all our guests can disconnect from reality for a little bit. There's much history at Camp Blue Ridge. In 2024, historians verified that there is a burial ground on the property. It's the final resting place of numberless, faceless, and unnamed local slaves and indigenous people. We contacted an uh, archeologist with a dog that helps identify remains of people, uh, even from that long ago. And they've come out and identify uh, four or five areas that a person is buried at. If they're slaves, if they're indigenous people, they're people who need to be recognized. Uh, and so we're going through that process of putting in a small little park with a sign to help people be able to guide themselves through there. Originally established in 1904 as the Adventist Book Center, the store expanded its offerings to accommodate the broader Christian community by the 1960s. In 1961, a new building was erected in Tacoma Park to support this growth. By 1993, its sales surpassed $6 million, earning it the title of the world's largest ABC. In response to the evolving community needs, stakeholders decided in 2015 to change the name to better reflect their mission of enhancing physical, emotional, and spiritual well-being. Thus, the name Living Well was chosen. In addition to offering books, Bibles, food items, music, organic skincare products and gifts, Living Well now hosts Bible studies. These studies provide the community with an opportunity to deepen their spiritual understanding, connect with like-minded individuals, and explore biblical teachings in a supportive group setting. Serving 23 different denominations, Living Well has gained the reputation as the community store for better living. One hundred years later, the Potomac Conference continues to expand and grow. With 80% of Potomac's members living in the northern region, after years of discussion about moving the conference administrative office to the north, 
The executive committee took a significant action that would provide a viable solution to what had become a years-long dilemma. The committee elected to keep the current location in Stanton, Virginia, and open a satellite office in the north to enhance support for our valued members and staff. In May 2024, the conference celebrated the grand opening of its northern office at 5203 Manchester Avenue in Camp Springs, Maryland, reaffirming its commitment to expanding the reach and connections beyond physical boundaries. The three-building campus will house the Conference Media Center, a chapel, administrative office space, and the Hispanic School of Theology. As you can see, a lot has changed over these past 100 years. But with all the changes that have taken place in our conference, there's one thing that remains the same, and that is our unwavering commitment to expand the kingdom of God by taking the gospel or the good news of Jesus Christ and moving beyond the walls of our churches and into the hearts and lives of those for whom Christ died. And as Ellen White reminds us in Ministry of Healing, page 144, Accompanied by the power of persuasion, the power of prayer, the power of the love of God, this work will not, cannot be without fruit. So as we continue on this journey of growing healthy disciples of Jesus Christ, we invite you to commit to praying with us and for us that God will use the people of the Potomac Conference as salt and light to a world that is in desperate need of both as never before, as we commit to boldly lifting up the name of Jesus Christ, first in our homes and then in our various communities, as we await our Savior's soon return. May God bless us all to this end.